Professor Tassos Kiriakides completed his BSc as a Fulbright Scholar at UCLA and received his doctoral degree from the Yale School of Public Health in 1999, studying the epidemiology of infectious diseases. He is assistant professor at Yale School of Public Health, where he guides and helps design, operationalize, and analyze data from numerous clinical research projects. As a senior researcher, he consults on methodology, data processes and management, and statistical analysis for research protocols. He serves on numerous clinical trial oversight committees and is a statistical reviewer for high-impact journals. He is the co-proponent for the establishment of the Yale Olive Sciences and Health Institute that will focus on the olive tree and its products and their effects on human and planetary health. He frequently gives talks on the health benefits of olive oil, such as the talk we're going to hear today. And he is the principal investigator of a research project to assess the benefits of table olives on cardiovascular markers among college students. He is a trained and certified olive oil sommelier and a legacy circle member of the Massaro Community Farm in Woodbridge, Connecticut. He is the immediate past president of the Association of Yale Alumni in Public Health uh, for the board of the association. And he's a faculty fellow at Sacred College. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lauren, and thank you, Rhoda, and the Yale Alumni Academy for hosting me on this, uh, uh, what I hope will be a very engaging uh, uh, conversation. Uh, I'm going to switch over to my slides. Um, and as I'm doing that, I'm glad to see um, uh, the sort of the geographical and the uh, um, um, the geographical diversity uh, of the uh, people attending today. It's great to see some, recognize some names uh, from um, this work that I'm starting to do the last four or five years. And let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay, uh, share, okay. Um, and as Lauren said, um, the uh, the work, uh, um, I have a sort of a diverse background, but uh, I always want to thank uh, my journey to this, where I am now in this, in this area, in addition to the other work I do, both at the Yale School of Public Health and the, um, the Clinical Trust Center under the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Research and Development, the coordination of uh, multi-center, multi-year clinical trials for the Department of Veterans Affairs, I found my way back into the Grove and you can see my background is a Grove that I visit almost every year with the exception of the uh, two years of the pandemic. And I volunteer uh, to help the, um, the owner uh, pick the olives and it's a great experience. If any of you have a chance to, to do that, uh, it will be a, a very uh, rewarding and very fulfilling experience to, um, to, 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 um, to put down on your, uh, uh, on your bucket list perhaps. Um, so as Steve Jobs said, um, you can always connect the dots going backwards. And to me, uh, back in 2006, when we started here with the, um, the help of the Hellenic Studies program at, uh, under the Macmillan Center, we launched uh, a year-long initiative to have uh, panels on Medi the Mediterranean way of, uh, of mainly nutrition, but uh, it expanded to lifestyle. And from that, and during that time, um, where I invited people uh, across the board from science, bench scientists to sociologists and uh, physicians and nurses and people involved in, in nutrition and health in general, I met a lot of people and that idea was percolating for a while until 2017. Uh, as was mentioned by Lauren, I, I did some training um, at the International Culinary, Culinary Center in New York. And that's where I got the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the bug, if you will, to go back uh, a few decades in, uh, as, a, as a first grade uh, student in, back in Cyprus where I grew up. Uh, my favorite field trip was in an olive mill. And, and my friends at the time thought it, that was strange because the smell of an olive mill sometimes is not um, the most appealing to, especially to a six-year-old. But um, 
fast forward uh, for decades uh, in 2018, I was uh, discussing this with um, uh, the, the, um, the chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences here at the School of Public Health. And I said, uh, a university, a school of public health like Yale should have something on the Mediterranean nutrition in particular on, on the olive tree and what it can, uh, the, the positive uh, attributes that it can have on, on human and planetary health. And from that, we launched what I'll describe a little bit later. But first, I wanna share, because uh, I saw a lot of comments in the chat um, on, on things related to the olive tree. And I wanna share um, some, a little video put out by a company um, that, um, uh, that over the years we've we've done some work and they've been very supportive of what we're trying to do and and the the, the person who started it uh, we're working on a couple of things currently, but I think it sets the tone for what um, and, and this applies to all the I would say all the um, the olive um, olive oil and olive producing countries uh, how the olive tree itself ties with culture and history and this is obviously uh, it's a bias of mine this is uh, reflects the, the sort of the greek version but i think it, it, it captures very nicely in a short four minutes of what what the olive tree means for for in this case the greek culture so um and after that we'll go into some more um oops if i can start the video
so in this little four minute segment, a uh, little video that you've seen, um, it, it captures, in my opinion, a lot of what um, the olive tree means to, um, to, to places where this tree has been uh, around for thousands of years. And this has some pictures of um, um, trees that, olive trees that um, some of you, those of you who visited the Parthenon, you'll see that tree every time I visit. I take a picture of it uh, and I save it like my yearly homage to, to this tree uh, near the Parthenon. And the one on the left is from the grove uh, that's in the background that, um, that um, you see on, on the screen. Um, there's so many things to, to decompose from that four minute video. And, and I think um, even though um, when I first saw it, I, I had to comment to the owner then of the company that I don't like the use of the word diet, especially the, the way the connotations come along in, in, in our uh, cultures in the, in the Western societies, because it implies uh, some sense of deprivation. And I don't think the Mediterranean way of living and, and eating has any of that uh, built in. Um, it comes from an ancient Greek word, which means something different from what we, uh, when we hear the word diet, immediately our mind goes, what should I reduce? What should I cut down on? Uh, and that goes contrary to uh, the Mediterranean way of living. Um, and those of you who've experienced, lived, or are from that part of the world or have roots from that can probably attest to that. But um, let's uh, go into a little bit more on the uh, on the tree. Um, again, the uh, because of the diversity of this of the of the audience today, I wanted to sort of set the uh, the tone wh where we're heading from here and give some foundation, uh, some some basic uh, concepts here. Uh, when we look at the tree, um, obviously we're all familiar with the products, uh, the olives, um, the olive oil. And uh, there's obviously uh, uh, products like leaves, the products, uh, the, the leaves and the flowers are actually um, being used, leaves, there's tea um, made of olive uh, leaves, etc. So it's not just the olive oil and the olives. Um, and just to make the statement that um, olives are a fruit. So when we think of olive oil, uh, it's actually the juice coming out of a fruit. Um, and that olive oil has, um, is primarily made of monounsaturated fat, fats um, and high in vitamin E and, and high phenol in content. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. And here's uh, sort of the, my, my one slide on the, uh, my biochemistry background. Uh, what is it actually made of? Uh, obviously, there's not going to be a test on this. So, but just for background information, this is what the composition of olive oil is. Um, but I think the, the, the sort of the, the main uh, theme here is how and in what ways is olive oil beneficial for our health, um, human health, and, and, and as more and more information is being gathered and more work is being done in the planetary aspects of uh, the, the impact of the olive tree and its cultivation on our environment. So let's start with what I think uh, was what opened the floodgates to a lot of investigation and research in, in the benefits of this kind of nutrition, where the central uh, one of the pillars is obviously olive oil. So some of you might be familiar with Ansel Keys and his seven country study. And one of the most famous slides from, from that study is, and, and you can see the countries that um, that study took place and in Greece it was uh, centered in, in Crete. So if you see this slide, uh, one thing you notice, um, and this was a uh, sort of a, a tab, uh, 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 the, the slide shows the, um, the 10 year coronary death rates of, of cohorts in this, in this country that they, were, that they studied. Uh, and the, uh, the amount, the percent of calories coming from, uh, from fat in, in the diet of those individuals in those countries. So if you can see, um, and I'm pointing here, hopefully you can see my arrow here, in East Finland uh, and in the US and Netherlands and, and Crete, about 40% of the calories was coming from fat. But if you notice, the, the um, the 10 year rate in Crete was almost nothing compared to um, East Finland with the highest over 600, about 700, um, 700 deaths per 10,000 men. So obviously that raises a question why, since the, the total 
percent uh, of calories from fat is coming is is the same across this four three four parts of the world why do we see such a marked difference and then from that um a lot of investigation a lot of research a lot of resources and time spent on trying to identify that and one of the reference materials that i included as part of this was sort of the website where you can find a lot of information of the seven study um seven study seven country study and uh, a lot of it, uh, um, a lot of the work continues to date, uh, stemming from that initial study. So, um, like I mentioned, the the olive oil is the cornerstone of of the Mediterranean nutrition. Um, and over the years, since that 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 um, the late '60s or early '60s, um, uh, mid '60s, that the seven um, country study was launched. The, um, there's a lot of evidence, uh, and it started with obviously since the focus of that study was um, cardiovascular, coronary heart disease. A lot of the evidence that we have now and accumulating still uh, to date is is in that um, disease area. Uh, a lot of work uh, has been happening in cancer, cognitive and neurological, brain health, uh, in, if we want to call it that under that umbrella name, uh, diabetes, endocrine, and metabol metabolic syndrome. So I'll, I'll share, obviously, in, in the, du during a, a webinar like this, it's impossible to, to spend a lot of time on each one, but I'll, I'll sort of give some highlights of the, the evidence that that's there, and, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. So. Um, Obviously, the uh, again the work that started back uh, then with the seven country study over time, uh, we're seeing a lot of accumulated evidence on um, the, that disease itself is not just one uh, condition; it's a complex of, of of disease conditions. And and trying to figure out what is the impact of the of the oil itself and and its components. Um, again, remembering that uh, the olive oil. Um, is primarily made of monounsaturated fatty acids, uh, and it has high uh, what we call phenols. Uh, and 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 how do we break that into, or how do we, do we figure out what is the what is the mechanism? And it's um, it's known now that uh, olive oil has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, and we know that the the conditions that come under cardiovascular coronary heart disease have a lot to do with inflammation and oxidation um, so now you have a natural product that um, can provide that anti-inflammatory and antioxidant so uh, starting from correlations and associations you go into um, sort of the the end of the evidence uh, generation spectrum or causality so a lot of studies since the 60s and repeatedly shown that these benefits and um, I should note that at the end, obviously, um, like I said, I'm not going to spend um, a lot of time on each of the slides showing the actual studies. But at the end, I have a PDF that I capture. Um, it has to be updated. This is as of April about 110 select publications uh, in peer reviewed journals um, to, to show both um, uh, the sort of the work has been done and, and evidence as well as some synthesis of um, review uh, uh, publications on the Mediterranean nutrition itself. Um, so the uh, one of the things that uh, was was noted was um, we have oleic acid, which is uh, one the most abundant um, mono, monounsaturated fat in olive oil. It it has an impact on C-reactive protein, and we know C-reactive protein is a marker for inflammation. So now you have something that reduces that inflammation. Um, as indicated by CRP levels, and therefore you have some downstream positive effects on on what that inflammation might cause down the road. The um, and, and obviously um, it's not just that um, that evidence alone. There's evidence from um, from work that's been done to show that oleocanthalin and oleuropein to other um, probably well known polyphenols. Um, are shown to, to act as anti-inflammatories. Um, and the, the person who discovered uh, oleocanthal, um, Gary Bouchamp down at an institute in, in, in Philadelphia, uh, it was almost by, he was telling the, the anecdote, he was in Italy for a conference uh, and um, he had a headache and somebody gave him sort of the, the Italian equivalent of ibuprofen. And uh, the, the taste and the bitterness in his mouth um, um, sort of reminded him 
days later when he was participating as part of that conference they did on olive oil tasting, when he tasted some um, fresh olive oil, it reminded him of that bitterness that he tasted in the, in the medication that he took for his headache. So he came back and was able to, to identify that the, what he was tasting in the olive oil was the natural equivalent of what the, um, the, that medication had, the, the anti-inflammatory that was in that um, uh, medication that he took for his headache. So if you search uh, oleocanthal um, and you see the Google hits that it got since Gary published on oleocanthal, you'll see sort of a, uh, an exponential growth in, in people looking for that oleocanthal. Uh, and he always tells the story at every uh, meeting that I've been. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, so the again, continuing the work, uh, it's been shown that um, oxidation of our um, lipids, especially LDL, the low density lipoprotein, leads to atherosclerosis. And we know that atherosclerosis is, is um, in the pathway of uh, coronary cardiovascular disease. So, uh, and we've also um, established that phenols that we find in olive oil are also preventing oxidative DNA damage. So put that together, you have a product that prevents that oxidation from happening. Uh, and all that evidence accumulated and um, uh, the uh, and I would say probably olive oil is one of the first, if not the only natural product that has a health claim by the European Union. Uh, and you can see the note there that um, if, if the olive oil contains at least five milligrams of this um, uh, hydro, hydroxytyrosol uh, and its derivatives, which is these are the, the phenols we're talking about per 20 grams of olive oil and 20 grams is about two tablespoons. So um, olive oil that has five milligrams of that in, in, in the two tablespoons can get this health claim that it can help uh, prevent the oxidation um, um, of lipids. Uh, which is really important to, to note uh, that the, uh, the, um, an EU regulatory body uh, has provided this for, um, for olive oil to claim uh, as part of, 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 um, of what it can do. Um, we know that uh, as, as we get older, uh, we have a decrease in, in HDL. Uh, but uh, it's been shown through uh, numerous studies that um, with olive oil consumption, you can reduce that uh, rate of decrease of your HDL. And as we know, the high density lipoproteins are, are good for you. We want the HDL to be high and we want the LDL to be low. Um, and uh, it's been shown that there's a linear increase in, 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 this hypo, in this high density lipoprotein as the phenolic content of the olive oil um, goes up. Um, and, you know, we won't get into the details of what, what are the ranges and what are the levels. I would say that um, on, on average, uh, on average, a good um, extra virgin olive oil would have probably close to 400, um, three to 400 milligrams per kilogram of, of uh, phenol content. Above that, uh, you're talking about high phenolic um, and, and ha could have an impact on, on LDL. Um, another dimension of cardiovascular coronary heart disease is blood pressure, and, and uh, studies have shown uh, either by themselves or in comparison with um, with other oils like sunflower oil that taking two or, uh, using two to three tablespoons of olive oil for as short as six months can have significant decreases in in your systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, the related to uh, functions like black clotting, for example, um, how does olive oil uh, impact that? Uh, it's been shown that it improves function in the lining of the blood vessels, and therefore it's, it, it helps prevent clotting, uh, which we know if, if that were to happen, it could lead into uh, downstream negative um, uh, implications for health, uh, heart attacks and strokes and the like. Um, Again, these three slides obviously cannot capture uh, years and years of work. Uh, and again, uh, I'll, I'll share at the end sort of the, the, the body of evidence um, that supports this uh, very uh, bullet-like uh, um, summary of, of the impact of olive oil on, on cardiovascular coronary heart disease. Um, cancer is another area that's, uh, that, that generated a lot of work and a lot of evidence uh, how olive oil uh, contributes positively towards preventing or um, 
because of its antioxidant capacity against free radicals. And we know that free radicals have a role to play in the uh, development um, of cancer. So again, oleocanthal has been shown to uh, selectively induce um, cancer, um, uh, and in particular breast and prostate cancer cells um, and, and uh, induces their death. Squalene, uh, another, uh, has been used as a tumor inhibitor, uh, and um, it, it's been shown to protect against UV protection, and you'll find squalene being used in some uh, products that are for sunscreen and, and other cosmetics uh, because of their UV protection, because of its UV protection capacity. Oleorupin, at least in the, in, the, in the lab, has been shown to inhibit cancer cell invasion and, and actually regress tumors. Um, I, I think uh, I should say that a lot of uh, the work that has happened has shown all this, uh, but there's a lot of questions that are unanswered and, and that, you know, that's part of uh, continuing down this path of identifying uh, mechanisms down to the, to the molecular level of the, why this is happening and what are the processes that are involved in, in, in making olive oil and its, and its components uh, have such a positive impact on, on health. Um, studies over the years have shown that uh, people who are in that part of the world, the Mediterranean, where most of the olive oil product production is happening and uh, most of the olive trees and cultivation is happening, there's a fairly low risk of cancer. Of course, there's a lot of other parameters that go into that. But if you account for all those, uh, still there's, a, there's a, an added benefit uh, by um, by by being in an area where um, olive oil is primarily the, 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 the fat of, of choice. Um, the, again, we mentioned the oleic acid, which is the predominant monounsaturated fatty acid in, in olive oil. It's, it's highly resistant to oxidation. Uh, and this has been shown that it, the, something that's highly resistant to that capacity, remember the, the DNA damage and, and the oxidation, um, um, uh, preventing that from happening could have beneficial effects on genes that are linked to cancer. And um, there's a, there was a study recently or the last few years to show that even it, it sort of slows down the, the shortening of the telomeres in, on, your, uh, on your chromosomes, which have, again, implications on longevity. And we've seen that, again, uh, from evidence, the, 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 um, the average life uh, span of individuals who, who consume or use uh, olive oil as part of their, of their uh, nutrition paradigm in, in that part of the world is, is um, uh, much higher than, than others. Um, and again, I, I alluded to this, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of work at, at that level, at the molecular level, how are the compounds and the ingredients or the, or the components of olive oil affecting uh, and helping fight cancer even at, at that level. Um, you know, in terms of brain health, which I think is a more recent uh, area that uh, people are starting to look into, uh, how does olive oil and its consumption uh, help in, in cognitive and neurological health? In the context of Alzheimer's, for example, um, the uh, which is um, the these plaques that develop that build up, um, they are made out of protein. And they, um, you see them um, depending on what stage of um, Alzheimer's disease the, 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 the patient is at. But there was a study that was done in mice that showed that oleocanthal, um, isolated uh, oleocanthal can help clear these plaques from the brain in, in mice. Um, so that, that might suggest that uh, cons consumption of olive oil might help um, um, at least slow down or prevent the formation of those um, uh, plaques. And recently, um, some cl uh, clinical trials, uh, which is sort of the, um, the, the, the highest level of evidence that you can accumulate um, because you have a control environment, you can, um, uh, you can control a lot of the factors by, by mainly through randomization. It showed that Mediterranean nutrition had favorable effects on both brain function and re reduced the risk of cognitive impairment in, in sort of a follow-up that, that, um, um, as part of, the, of, that, of that trial. Um, in, in diabetes, um, both in type, in type two, um, diabetes shown that olive oil has, uh, can improve the glycemic control in patients with type two. 
um, and we know that the what the impact of, of um, um, diabetes and elevated uh, glucose levels could, could have on heart disease and, and, and cancers like breast, prostate, colon, and leukemia. So by, by having a product, by consuming a product that's been shown that it could uh, have give you a better control of glycemic um, of, your, of your glycemic level. Um, it, it then has impact or, or in preventing, in reducing the risk of, of other diseases as listed there. Um, again, there was a, a very short study, but uh, showed that two tablespoons a day for two weeks, just two weeks, compared to individuals taking sunflower, using sunflower, uh, there was a significant decrease in, in fasting glucose and insulin. So the, the, the change is pretty quick uh, when you start consuming olive oil. Uh, and then when you look at insulin sensitivity, again, using uh, individuals with um, on, a, on a nutrition that was enriched with olive oil versus uh, individuals consuming vegetable oils for eight weeks, it showed that an insulin sensitivity was much better uh, in those consuming olive oil. Uh, there was an interesting study where um, they, they took uh, pasta and eggplant and they fried it in olive oil. And again, that that's sort of uh, against that myth that you cannot fry with olive oil, which is uh, not true. Um, so if you fry your pasta and eggplant in olive oil, um, that those individuals who did that showed that their blood um, glucose and insulin um, went, was lower compared to if you just added olive oil on top of it. So there's something that happens in that process and there's just some synergy that's happening between frying and, and saving probably the phytonutrients in the, in the eggplant in this case, um, and that's leading to the, the, the blood glu glucose to be lower than if you just added it on top. Uh, very interesting, uh, generates a lot of questions why and, and how, what the mechanism behind that. But uh, again, um, the, the evidence is, is there for this kind of, um, of um, positive impact. Um, extending into endocrine, en endocrine and metabolic syndrome, uh, early evidence, uh, still uh, cross-sectional studies and, and some meta-analysis, uh, there seems to be a, a very strong positive association between the, the nutrition that we see in the Mediterranean part of the, of the world in that, in that area uh, and metabolic health. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, ongoing work um, to because you go from some, some observational studies, some cross-sectional studies to generate hypotheses to what's the next step? Uh, how do we establish that this is the case? We go from association to then um, uh, establishing a causal uh, relationship between the, the benefits of, of that uh, kind of nutrition, again, with the pillar being olive oil and, and the outcomes we see at the end. Uh, it takes time because the, if you're going to do a study and eventually a clinical trial, these are um, have to to get data from a lot of participants and follow for a, quite a, uh, an extensive period of time to establish that, that causal uh, and cause and effect relationship, especially in conditions that are um, are not um, take time to to develop and see um, what the impact would be in either preventing it or um, reducing its incidence. Um, so I, again, this was a quick run through, but um, if I could put it into one slide over the last 60 years, we've accumulated enough uh, data, enough evidence to show that there's both direct and, and some indirect health benefits that uh, to me, that's probably the more, most interesting uh, area. Where's the synergy between other things in the Mediterranean nutrition or other things that, or, or between components uh, and, and in the olive oil that might might give us some indication, even at the molecular level, the mechanistic level, why is this happening? Um, and again, just uh, to emphasize this, this health claim uh, by the uh, European Food Safety Authority that, that gave olive oil this, um, the ability to claim that the polyphenols contribute to the to the protection of blood lipids from from that oxidative stress that we know it's 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 the sort of the beginning of of negative downstream effects. So um, and this was not this was based on a, accumulated evidence and presentation of this data uh, to get to that level that the regulatory agency would provide this claim for for olive oil. 
Um, where I think we're heading or, or sort of starting to, to head into the new frontiers, we, we all have heard about the gut uh, microbiome that, that's linked to immune status in our immune system. And what is the impact of olive oil on, on, on health through that gut microbiome? Uh, we know that the olive oil uh, imparts positive changes in the gut flora. Uh, we know that um, uh, there's bactericidal effects from olive oil on microorganisms that, um, for example, anything that we get through uh, food poisoning. We know that uh, because of the antioxidant activities of olive oil, there's some effect that uh, probably is mediated through the gut microbiome. If we think uh, uh, that the, the gut is where all the, uh, is the first place where things are processed, it makes sense that there's gonna be some role that olive oil has in, in its interaction with the gut microbiome uh, in, in then um, helping with um, uh, having a, an immune uh, system that, that's uh, quite robust and responsive. Uh, and therefore, um, I think there's a lot of work that's gonna happen in this, in this area right now. Uh, and, and in general, there's a lot, um, which I hinted before, it, it's not, uh, I don't think it's a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's a multifaceted impact, how olive oil or, or even olives we're getting into. I mean, there's work that's happened already in olives. Uh, and I'm going to show an example of that um, soon. Um, it, it's, it's a multifaceted, multidimensional uh, relationship that we have olive oil within the context of food uh, and, and its impact on, on human health. Um, really new things I think we're heading into. Uh, we know there's a lot of evidence on, the, on some components and a lot of work has been, has been done on them, oleocanthal, olirupin, uh, squalene. I've, I've named a few um, um, to the slide so far. But I, I think there's new phenols, new components that are yet to be discovered. Uh, it's interesting to, to see whether the proportions of, of certain phenols within olive oil have any uh, implication on, on the impact on health, uh, the interaction between them, uh, the mechanism of action. Again, we're at a stage where we can look at things at the cell level, the genome level. So a lot of that synergy um, that, that comes from known and soon to be discovered, I believe, components in, in, in olive oil or the interaction between them will shed a lot more light in, in sort of at, even at that level. I would not be surprised if we see new health claims. Uh, we have one on the oxidative stress. As more and more evidence accumulates, obviously there's going to be room for new health claims for maybe other uh, diseases. Metabolomics, a big area that now is, is, uh, uh, is gonna be a part of the work that's happening in this area here uh, in artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'll give you sort of an anecdote um, with um, folks here at the Environmental Health Sciences and, and the co-proponent um, for this institute I'm gonna mention later. They looked at using artificial intelligence, they, they looked at um, like a lot of groups were doing the same, looking at repurposed drug, using drugs to repurpose them for COVID, for example. Uh, and they, the group, uh, the, the team that looked at that then um, switched to, well, after that work was done, they said, well, we could probably do the same thing uh, looking at the components of olive oil. What, since there's data to show and there's information and evidence that this particular phenol, for example, has impact on these diseases, why don't we look at it using an artificial intelligence lens and see what are the possible uh, interactions and possible synergies that we can see using uh, data that's already accumulated. So that, that's something that, um, that, that's happening um, right now. Um, planetary health, uh, I, you know, it, it's still in its infancy, but we know, I mean, if, again, going back to that, to that little video, uh, this tree has been around for thousands of years. Uh, it's not very demanding. Uh, in terms of water, in terms of where it lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tree that's been shown and uh, there's the link if you're interested. Uh, I, I checked it last night, it's still there. Work that the International Life Council undertook, they showed that um, to, uh, when, when you look at the production of one liter of olive oil, um, 
it captures about 24 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's a carbon sink. The olive trees are carbon sink. So if you think of, of uh, ways of, of um, incorporating that into our uh, toolkit for um, climate change and, 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 and in addition to the, the benefits at the human level that we get, at the human health level that we get, I think we have a tree that could provide um, some some help in in that area um the the sustainability component uh, obviously uh ties in with the planetary health we have uh, a culture uh, uh, the the, cult, the agriculture behind all, the olive tree could provide for a sustainable model and there's examples uh, in different parts of the, definitely the Mediterranean where we've seen that uh, and there's a lot of work that's happening uh, and we're involved in some projects uh to set up uh, some pilot examples of how could an olive grove be a model for sustainability and already it's happened um, uh, because aside from the during the the harvest time which is a very limited time um, window what do you do with the re with the rest of the time in the grove uh, and there's uh, there's a lot of examples of how people have used that uh, to incorporate other dimensions of agriculture within the grove that that has a synergistic effect with the tree but also the tree provides something to that uh, other diverse and sustainable uh, forms of agriculture that might be happening in the grove during those times or year round uh, so there's a lot of um, Again, uh, the, the using of the tree in the context of planetary health um, uh, and, and ways to improve that is a synergistic uh, and, and multidimensional um, uh, approach that I, I, I definitely I've seen it in a couple of uh, grows, both in, in Cyprus and, and, and in Greece. Um, and, uh, you know, it's probably going to be um, taking a lot of uh, people's time to, time to think about how do we set it up in the context of what we're seeing and experiencing uh, in terms of climate change. Um, so where are we now? Uh, where has that led? You know, the, the, the journey that um, uh, we started back in 2018 here, um, we have a proposal to, as Lauren men alluded to, um, with uh, Dr. Vasiliu, the, the chair of the Environmental Health Sciences here to establish the, this, this institute that will serve as the interface and catalyst between the US and, and others across the world uh, working on the olive tree um, its pro and its products. And following the, um, our, uh, the pillars of our university um, here, we're gonna focus on, on the three main um, concepts, education, uh, interdisciplinary activities, rigorous study and research uh, and, and engagement of, of stakeholders, communities that are gonna benefit from that. Uh, and in doing that, we're, we've set up uh, both academic and public and industry partnerships with people across the world, um, both within the US and obviously overseas uh, to, to see how we can foster sort of the, the, the furthering this research and, and really take a, a role in, in disseminating the information um, and, and generating new evidence to show what, what this sustainable olive agriculture can do both for human and for planetary health down, downstream. Um, in setting this up back in 2018, and, and I'll show you what we've done so far, um, obviously we, we had to think how we organized. We created this uh, six core groups that uh, everything uh, that happens uh, obviously in these work groups ties in together. Um, you cannot talk um, with the gastronomy and culture work group, for example, without um, talking to the industry, because without industry, we don't have a product. And without the product, we cannot do the work we want to do. Likewise, you cannot um, think of, of uh, projects and, and uh, initiatives from a nutrition perspective if you don't talk to the, 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 the policy and economics um, folks, because there's implications uh, when, you, you, when you want to put projects forth and initiatives that will change or have recommendations related to nutrition. Obviously, now you bring in policy changes that you have to account for. 
So we tried to to have these core groups um, take the lead in, within their own uh, activities to to propose projects that we as an institute will help facilitate both in identifying support, but also um, do things that we can as Yale School of Public Health is in Yale University, we can provide support, but also bring in partners from across the, um, the, um, the, the world. And in the opening of our first symposium that we held here in 2018, uh, one of the opening statements I made was the goal of this is to, to to sort of uh, uh, use some wordplay here, open the groves uh, because we need to work together uh, no matter where you are uh, in, in, in this sort of spectrum of the olive tree and its, and its agriculture. Um, we have to come together if you're an academic, if you're a, a, um, an organization, if you're industry, at the end of the day, uh, it's working together that will, will get us where we, we, th we think this could bring us in terms of human and, and, and planetary health. So what we've done so far, um, we had we held three um, symposia. Um, the first one being in New Haven, we had about a hundred uh, and you know, close to two hundred people attend in October of two thousand eighteen. It was a one day event. We had twenty one presentations back to back, uh, and of course, the only way to keep people for that engaged for that long is to promise them a nice dinner at the end. It always works, and it did work. Uh, we from that we went to Delphi uh, in two thousand nineteen. The program expanded. Uh, we had great presentations and conversation and, and things launched from there. Uh, we took a, um, a break, uh, a forced break in uh, 2020. Uh, we didn't, even though we had it planned from, for Spain in 2020, uh, we had to skip that and, and we uh, pushed it to 2021 uh, in Jaén. Uh, again, to me, that was the first time that we had um, the people working in the planetary, uh, planetary health, sustainability, climate change, biodiversity, bioeco bioeconomies, uh, and the human health side of this on the same stage, in the same panels discussing, uh, even though they were both doing their work separately, to me, that was the first time we were able to bring everybody together to discuss how um, projects that each, were, each group were thinking would impact the other and how the other would be involved. And we put out the proceedings from that, and you can see I highlighted in yellow the main conclusions from that um, December 21, Third International Symposium, sustainability, climate change mitigation, biodiversity, uh, collaborative work, human and planetary health dimensions of the Grove. And that gave us sort of the, the path forward to strengthen that synergy towards mutual maximum mutual benefit. And I think there's a lot of potential there. So, um, the uh, so the symposia was is one of our uh, main uh, activities uh, uh, and going forward it will remain so uh, but what we also want to do is community engagement that that's another um, if you do the research and you educate people um, you you need to bring it to the community that's going to benefit from that so uh, this earlier this year we had this event where um, we took a lot of these themes and we said okay how do we um, expose people to this kind of, of, of um, information and in an experiential way. So um, we revived uh, through, we found in, in, um, in ancient Greek um, documents and writings, um, recipes that, that we would find and we re, um, revived them. And we use, we brought a chef in and we, uh, I worked with him and I said, this is what the, the recipe calls for, or it called for back then and based on what we found and he executed based on, on, on that. The, the idea was not just to see if we can replicate that, that, um, that uh, recipe in particular, but it was to highlight how the, what we, what people were enjoying at that dinner in April was a continuation of what was what started thousands of years ago. Um, and building on, on that concept of the history, the sort of the, the evidence that we accumulated so far uh, on the benefits that, that those ingredients and those recipes could have on our health. 
and on the planet as well. So in that conversation, it was more of a conversation symposium kind of thing. Everything that would come in front of people, we would talk about it both from a culinary perspective, uh, not my area of expertise, but uh, from the health perspective, I would put in my, my comments on um, how, how that link exists and how we need to continue going forward, thinking of sustainable ways uh, and, and regenerative ways of, of ensuring that our food and our nutrition, uh, especially uh, as we've gone through two, three years of a pandemic, uh, maybe it's time to step back and reset and think of ways that we could bring in these concepts in our everyday life through nutrition. Um, and another thing that uh, Lauren alluded to, um, uh, research is definitely a big component of an institute uh, like what we're envisioning. And we're launching a clinical trial uh, using olives uh, as a supplement, uh, olive supplementation of, of the um, um, of the nutrition that our students here get at Yale. Um, it's going to be a randomized trial. Half of them will 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 continue eating the amazing food that Yale now provides through Yale Hospitality. And the other half are going to get uh, five to six olives per day uh, for a period, um, for a short period of time. We'll assess some uh, cardio, mainly cardiovascular uh, markers uh, at baseline. And then four weeks later, after they consume the, the daily uh, olives. Um, has been approved by our ethics uh, committees, obviously, uh, and we're going to launch this fall, and we'll see what what that shows. And this is building on um, evidence from other uh, studies. A uh, couple of other studies have been done. Um, definitely, um, I am aware of one that took place in Athens, a smaller study in hospitals. We took it in a different setting. We wanted to 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 test it here, uh, and obviously the. Uh, I, we, we built it in a way that it's um, any data, any evidence that will, will be shown. I would I would be very surprised if if it if it was not absorbed into the um, into the, the sort of the the menu, so to speak. This kind of olives uh, that were donated by a company uh, to to do this study. So um, again, starting a little bit of that and, and just uh, data that was presented actually in our symposium in Delphi in 2019, a group from, uh, I believe it was Barcelona, they showed that the, uh, to achieve the equivalent of that, uh, health claim, the five milligrams of hydro hydroxytyrosol in 20 uh, grams of olive oil, if you, if you consumed five, uh, olives of high phenolic content, it would be the equivalent of taking that 20 grams of olive oil. So um, that was presented for the first time in Delphi. Um, then a couple of other groups started looking at that and doing some small studies. And, and this is sort of coming uh, at, at the sort of continuation of that in order to see how we can uh, add something to the, to the knowledge and, and implement it in a setting like, like this. Um, where are we heading? Um, Next uh, next month, our fourth symposium is going to be held in Rome, uh, Portugal, tentatively 2023, and um, going out west. Uh, partnership with U UC Davis that has the Olive Oil Center there, um, and obviously um, the International Olive Council. We're going to be partnering in setting up that symposium in 2024. Uh, the idea is an institute, we're going to have a quarterly journal for scientific publications, um, as well as other publications that are pertinent to the institute's activity and what the scope is. Education and training, obviously, is going to be a big part of that. Um, the, the, we've done a lot of work with Yale Hospitality, a lot of events, uh, and we are lucky to have uh, the support of Yale Hospitality and Yale College, because uh, maybe a fact that not a lot of people know that uh, if we look at the US average consumption of olive oil is about a liter per person per year. Compare that with about 20 plus in, in Greece, uh, about 12 or 13 in Spain and Italy, uh, US is at one. Uh, Yale, the last, um, um, I would say six years, they've gone from that average about 0.97 liters per person per year to close to six 
pushing to, towards six and a half liters per person per year. So they looked at all the meals across a year. And in six years, they were able to do that. And mainly um, focusing on changes in nutrition that they provide, a lot of plant-based um, food that if, if you happen to be on campus and you go into a cafeteria, it will be very different from the time you were here. Uh, definitely was it's different than when I was here. Um, and, and with a change in the paradigm of nutrition, uh, obviously olive oil has a place and that's why we're seeing the, the increase. So uh, we, did a, we did a lot of programming with the Yale Hospitality and the dining um, facilities. We want to take that concept and, and maybe go into middle and high schools and even elementary schools because a lot of education has to happen even at that early level to appreciate the, 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 the utility and the benefit of, of product, a product like olive oil. Research and development, obviously, uh, I've shown you some examples of what projects we're working on. Um, we're working uh, with a couple of um, academic institutions here to look at maybe uh, another study in, um, in brain health, uh, working with somebody from Temple and, and Auburn um, and maybe Columbia University. Um, we're doing some projects with, um, uh, with folks in, in Italy, uh, starting some things in, in Greece and Cyprus. So there's a lot of uh, potentials there uh, for projects and, and engaging with that. The um, tying with community engagement and uh, specialized symposia, we're helping the, uh, the, the city of Heraklion in, in Crete. They're putting forth a proposal to be a UNESCO gastronomy city for next year. And as part of the proposal, uh, we're going to put together the first gastronomy symposium under the Yale Olive Sciences and Health Institute. Uh, it's scheduled to be May 9th and 10th next year. And again, um, keep in mind that Crete, uh, that's where, if you recall from the first slide, that's uh, where the um, uh, the location in Greece that was part of the seven country study. And uh, for those of you who, who, who know, Creed is sort of the, the, um, the model of, uh, that gave a lot of what we know about Mediterranean nutrition uh, now with people like um, uh, um, Dr. Trichopoulos and, and, and both of them, uh, husband and wife, um, who've dedicated their, all their uh, professional careers in, in showing the, the benefits of Mediterranean nutrition. Um, that's our um, upcoming symposium uh, in, in Rome. And that's the link. If anybody is interested, please uh, feel free to register. Uh, it's two amazing days of, of a program uh, with a lot of interactive uh, activities. And I think part of, uh, just as a side note, in putting the symposium together, I, I always thought that um, if we don't engage in interactive activities, whether it's um, tasting olive oil, or whether it's um, having um, um, live presentations by chefs or, or exposing people who are attending this in, 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 in other uh, things related to, to the food and the olive oil, then we missed an opportunity to sort of have people experience what, what this is all about. So um, just like any symposium uh, that we put together, this one is going to be rich in the interactive and the experiential uh, component, in addition to the scientific and the discussion and panel um, sessions that we're going to have on a lot of topics. We try to, every, every symposium, we try to see what is the, the current hot topic. And this year, uh, some of you might have heard, the Nutri-Score is a new front of um, of product labeling proposal that was put out. Uh, there's a lot of conversation, discussion, uh, sometimes heated conversations in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, we'll have a, a good chunk of, of this symposium dedicated to discussions on around that issue because uh, based on that, the um, olive oil got, uh, it's an A through E um, letter uh, assignment of products. And um, uh, olive oil got a, I think a C, um, somebody might correct me, um, which is the same as, for example, um, Coca-Cola would get. Um, so obviously this is not something that um, um, would, would be well received and it has not been well received in the community. So there's, gonna be, there's other efforts and initiatives to, to, um, to change that and propose a more appropriate uh, labeling um, scheme for, for products like olive oil. Um, so in conclusion, 
um, the impact of olive oil on health, both human uh, and, and planetary is multidimensional. Uh, obviously the evidence that, that has accumulated is on the human health. Uh, a lot is coming um, as well. Uh, and in addition to planetary health, um, the, I mentioned the, I, I think what, what, what I see coming is the, this additive and synergistic effect um, in the components of olive oil or olive oil in the context of of other things, and we're going to see a lot of work in the at the gene and cell level of what is the impact of, of, of olive oil. Uh, and uh, whenever I say olive oil, I always remind myself to, to talk about olives because that's another um, um, area that that's uh, going to be a, a great focus, not just our institute, but in general uh, across the you know among people working in this in this area, as well as uh, leaves. Um, um, t um, teas made or, or supplementation with, um, with uh, olive leaves. Um, and I, I'm just going just to show you again, this is sorry, this is outdated. I haven't had a chance to update it. Uh, and and I'll, I'll make that available um, for those who registered. Um, I, I separate this and I keep track of, of what's happening. Uh, one of the references that I provided for today is from a publication that came out, I think last month in Lancet. It was a major paper uh, using, um, looking at um, olive oil Mediterranean nutrition as a secondary uh, prevention, uh, primary prevention um, being preventing something from happening the first time, the incidence of that disease, as opposed to secondary, this, this, this study was among people with cardiovascular disease and showed that it had an impact on secondary prevention of other things related to, to, to the cardiovascular disease that they had. Um, so um, again, I separated by, by disease area. Uh, and at the top, I gave sort of the, some uh, material diet reviews um, Again, uh, not my choice of word, but um, I'm going to stick with that since it becomes it's been used widely. Hopefully, one day it will change. Um, so I'll make that available, like I said, um, at the end. Uh, I'll, and you can, um, if you're interested, feel free. Some of them are free. You can access them either through a library or free online. So uh, I'll pause right there um, and. Uh, thank you for attending. Hopefully I provided some uh, uh, useful information. And um, like I said, when you're in this, um, you have to uh, enjoy what you do, uh, not uh, on in your office or in the, in the lab or wherever you are, but also in the kitchen. And this is some of the things that I um, do uh, as a, as I use it as my meditation using olive oil uh, in all sorts of uh, foods. So I'll pause there and uh, we'll open it up for questions, I guess. Thank you so much, Professor Kiriakides. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. I can say that the chat was brimming with questions and some people answering each other's questions. I know we have a number of questions already in the Q&A box. If you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, that helps me to keep track and make sure we get your question answered. I will try to uh, look at some of the questions in the chat as well to see um, if we could get those answered. And I also just want to mention, um, because I didn't mention at the beginning, that this presentation is part of our Yale Alumni Academy Festival of Ideas and Enrichment, which we do each summer online here to bring you some of the scholarship from our excellent Yale faculty, such as uh, Professor Kiri Kibis that we've heard from today. And so we have one more presentation in this series taking place on Thursday at four. We will be reviewing the um, root of our cruise, um, which is going very close to Greece, but uh, situated in Turkey, the footsteps of St. Paul. So if you have interest in travel to Turkey, please tune in on Thursday at four. Um, I also just want to acknowledge a couple of the people who introduced themselves in the chat because I think it, it illustrates just how fascinating and wide ranging of a topic this is, um, Professor. So we have the first olive oil producer from in Santa Barbara wine county since 95, right? Who's also an olive oil sommelier. 
and learned to make olive oil in the 90s in Crete um, with parents from Greece. And then we have um, Bill, who's on the board of the American Farm School in Thessaloniki, which has an olive center and hosts international olive conferences. Um, and then we have Hilton from Santa Monica, California, who works in skincare with a Sicilian-based skincare company. The base of all of our products are olive oil and olive leaf water. Uh, and I also wanted to just acknowledge um, Vincent, who's on the clinical faculty in the Department of Ophthalmology and, and lectures residents on ocular nutrition, deeply interested in fatty acid physiology and olive oil from that standpoint. And I just think, you know, this is really, uh, there was one more, um, Edith, who talks about climate change and participating at DEEP as the uh, Environmental Justice Program Administrator. I know there was another introduction speaking about looking at planting olive trees um, as a climate, both a climate choice, as well as just from a landscaping choice as an effective landscaping tree. I think that's Jim that talks about commercial landscaping and Paul Springs. So we have everything from skincare to ocular health, to landscaping, to climate change, um, really, I think, uh, reinforces the value of your presentation today, um, Professor. So thank you so much for being here with us and thank all of you for your, um, for your very interesting questions. Uh, I know one that people just sort of universally brought up was how we as consumers of olive oil can understand how to make choices um, around you know, what we, what we purchase at the store, what we consume and how we consume it. So you uh, showed one of the brands that's being used in the Yale study um, that I believe was a, a brand from Crete. But, you know, many of us shop at Trader Joe's or the grocery store. What is the difference between the $6.99 bottle of olive oil that I get at Trader Joe's that may say Kalamata on it um, and the $30 bottle of olive oil at Edge of the Woods here in New Haven, which is our local health food store, right? That is cloudy and, and kind of murky looking and, and appears to be not highly processed. And how do I discern what I should buy? So, I mean, consumer education is... Uh, can you hear me? Consumer education is like the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, it, it's and and, um, and and definitely here. I mean, if you you go in other parts of the world, like I'm going to single out three countries: Italy, Spain, and Greece. You know, a lot more. Um, you know, we we don't need to talk about things that we have to struggle here every day, um, because there's a lot of other oils that are used and and uh, promoted. Um, the, the, there's a lot of work that's happening in, in that field, educating consumers. And a lot of that has to start with, it, it, again, the, it has to be a concerted effort, both from the academia, if you will, but also the, the, sort of the industry educating people. And if you think about the, the immediate, um, the first interaction that you would have with food would be, for example, at a restaurant. So if we don't educate the chefs, for example, to use olive oil and, and, and teach what they're using, then we miss that, that opportunity. But stepping back, you know, we'll go to a store, what do we look for? Well, a lot of the, I mean, I, I've been paying attention to what's been happening and, and I know some people here um, might have been too. Um, you know, the, the, there's different levels of, of, of olive oil. There's the extra virgin olive oil, the virgin olive oil, olive oil, and lampante, which we don't see here, or um, we might see it, but it's not called that. So, and, and those, that gradation is based on, on uh, standards that are set by International Olive Council. Uh, so an extra virgin olive oil has to meet certain criteria. One, it has to have 0.8% acidity or less. Uh, California actually has lowered that to 0.5% acidity. Uh, on their own, they decided that's our standard. 
Um, it, uh, an extra virgin olive oil should not have any defect and there's panels and, and testing that happens to identify those, those uh, defects. Um, and uh, it has to have positive attributes, smell, taste. And so there, there's standards that are, are used to, to call something extra virgin. So when in a store you see something that says light olive oil, immediately I look at it and thinking, what does light mean? Is it blended with all sorts of oils? And actually I've picked up bottles from, I'm not gonna name the store, where it says olive oil. And then you look back and it says, it might contain olives from five different countries, that's fine. Um, that's a di totally different issue, but it can include maybe up to one or 2% of, 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 of olive oil and the rest is other oils. So, but they are allowed to, to promote it as such. So the education has to start from that level. When you say olive oil, what does it include? And a lot of the uh, few companies that I've seen, um, they, they use a lot of, they try to put as much information as they can on the bottle. Meaning, when was it harvested? When was it bottled? And they have to put an expiration date. You know, how long is it on the shelf? And just next time you go to the grocery store, um, and, and just for context, the olive oil that comes from the Northern hemisphere, we look at Spain, Italy, Greece, you know, uh, North Africa, those are those are oils that are har har trees that are harvested uh, anywhere from September all the way to December, let's say. So they won't hit the market here until March, April, by the time they get bottles shipped and everything. Um, we get it in California, it's easier. We, we gets harvested, pressed, it's on the shelf uh, much faster. So if, if you get the ship, if you're a grocery store and get the shipment in March, April, but you have leftover from two years ago, you're gonna put the, the older olive oil in front and then the newer oil in the back, or you might not even put it on the shelf. So look for, for things like, when was it harvested? That will give you an indication how fresh the oil is, because unlike wine, um, olive oil has to be consumed fresh. The, fre the, the fresher, the, the, the better. Um, so of course that, again, that's not an issue in countries where they use a lot more than what we do. Um, I mean, if you, if you think of a, in Italy, for example, the, uh, a liter a month on average, it goes fast. You don't have to think about my oil is gonna be bad. But I have friends here who have oil from three years ago. And I said, well, that, you know, I wouldn't use that. It, they it's are not, definitely it, not consuming yes. enough olive Well, it, it, <laughs> that's one, but it's not gonna do any any harm, but you're not getting the benefits that you you're could from a benefits. fresher oil. Um, so look for things that tell you how fresh it is. Um, you know, when you see light or when you see, read in the back, it's blended with other oils. Um, I, you know, people have their own flavor profiles. They, they like what they like, but um, in terms of the, you, I, you wouldn't expect to get a benefit from an oil that's 5% olive oil and the rest is some other oil compared to a good olive oil. And I'm told that it matters if it's a cold pressed versus another processing technique. Well, that, that's that's um, again by definition the the um, the mechanical extraction of olive oil has to happen under a certain uh, temperature. temperature. So by definition, any high quality olive oil is below that temperature. So whether you call it cold press or whatever, it meets that. But I, I think it was another probably at some point a good marketing thing. Cold pressed. Every by definition, high quality olive oil to pass that standard has to be below a certain temperature when you press the olives. Um, so, uh, and the other idea of filtered or unfiltered. Uh, unfiltered, you know, again, if you use them, if you take an unfiltered and a filtered oil, if you use it quick, then it shouldn't matter. But if you let it sit there, what happens with the unfiltered oil um, basically means that, you have leftover, whether it's water droplets or um, you know little pieces of, of um, the, the, the fruit, the skin, whatever. And those things increase the, the, the likelihood of a defect developing in your oil. 
becoming oxidized because now you have water in it as opposed to filtered that removes all that. Again, if you use it quickly, I mean, I, I've had both and they're just as good. It's just a matter of if you let it sit there for longer than, than a couple of months, you might start tasting different if you had the unfiltered versus the filtered. I see. Okay. We have a, a lot of people who had sort of these kinds of questions, and I think you've answered a number of the questions, but people wanted to know um, whether, for example, a, a good point is, is there a source that documents specific olive oil brands, uh, the biochemical composition, Robert, Robert wants to know. Um, and someone else has asked, what makes a difference to the nutrition? Does the location of the olive tree, the age of the olive tree, how it's grown, how it's harvested, is some of this we've talked about, but I think people are curious, you know, how do I discern sort of uh, the, some of the chemicals that you mentioned, right? They're not in every kind of olive oil. It depends on the tree. It depends on the type of olive. It depends on the soil quality. So how can people so, navigate those kinds of ideas? Yeah, I mean, we're not at a point, at least as far as I know, that a company will put out the composition of its olive oil in terms of there's so much, um, you know, oleocanthal, so much. Uh, but in general, a high quality olive oil will have in different proportions, and it varies by location. It varies by uh, cultivar. Uh, there's not just one variety of olive oil, of, of olive that produces olive oil. There's many, there's actually close to 1500, if I'm not mistaken, cultivars. Not all produce olive oil. Some of them are used for olives um, predominantly and others are, are used for, for olive oil, but not all of them are used for olive oil. So depending on the cultivar, you get a different composition of those phenols. Uh, a variety in Spain uh, could produce a higher level of this proportion, but you don't see that in the bottle. They, they're not going to put it there. It's only if you do if you take the oil and you want to focus. Let's say you want in a project to use a high oleocanthal, sixty percent, seventy percent. You have to identify that because that's what you want to do in your research. But I haven't seen it in a label. I don't think it's going to be coming soon. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But again, I go back to the, if we do a, a better job of ensuring that the, the quality of the olive oil that hits the market and is on the shelf is maintained, then whether you get an olive oil that is 50% oleocanthal and 30% something else or, or the other way around, in the long run, it shouldn't matter. Um, and I think it comes down to making sure that that quality is maintained. Now, when and where, um, it, it's a whole different question. Uh, like I said, a harvest in at least in the Mediterranean um, uh, countries starts as early as September. Now, if you harvest a tree early, if you, for those of you who've seen trees in September, the, the fruit is still green on the tree. Um, if you harvest that early, you're capturing the tree and the fruit at a point where it's trying to hold as, to, to its nutrients as much as possible. So the, the, the phenols that we see is a, is, a reaction, is, a, is a reaction to the stress you're putting on the tree, pretty much. It's a, it's a, it's a defense mechanism to put out those, those um, phenols that have a very pungent and a very spicy taste. So if you harvest early, it's, it's sort of the, the fruit is not ripe. So you're harvesting at a stage where the, the, the phenol level will be the highest. So if you look at uh, the same growth, for example, if you harvested half of it in September and half of it in October, a month later, the profile in terms of the phenols is going to be very different. The earlier one will give you a higher phenol content com compared to the October one. You can go as late as December sometimes and you get, but the fruit changes. Now it's no longer green. It's more mature. You get higher a higher amount, so the quantity goes up because now it's more juicy, for lack of better definition, as opposed to earlier, that's a more dense fruit, but you get more phenolic content. Uh, and the location does change. I mean, I've tasted oil from the um, from the grove that's in my background. This, and I've tasted oil from a grove about 40 miles north of this grove same variety of, of, of tree, very different oil. 
in terms of flavor, in terms of taste, and I would suspect in terms of phenol content. So where it grows, um, both physical environment and and sort of you know what what the, the wind, the exposure to sunlight, and all that, um, and what grows around it obviously affect the, the what it is. Uh, but again, going back to a good high quality olive oil, no matter where it's coming from, it's good for your health. That's sort of the, the, the message. If you want to get into details, what oil, and then let alone go into details of culinary uh, implications, what oil goes with this food? Not every oil will be good for every kind of food you want to serve or eat. So that just like wine, you pair olive oil with the kind of food you want to eat. Now you're going into your sommelier. Yes, role. yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's another totally different role. Different, well, different. I think I think a question that um, I know people discussed in the chat a bit was, you know, um, there was a conversation about omega-6 versus omega-3 content. Um, and the idea was presented in the chat that olive oil has a high omega-3 content. And I seem to recall that omega-3s are destroyed by heat. Um, well, so, yes. so there's this whole question about, you know, we can think olive oil is great, but if we're making French fries and the deep fryer in it, is it still great? So uh, can you talk about heating yeah. it? And there was also uh, that study you mentioned, sorry, I'm throwing a few yeah, things yeah, at you all yeah. at once, but the study that you mentioned that showed pasta and eggplant fried in olive oil um, were, were be better for you essentially than yep. just adding three tablespoons of olive oil a day to your diet. So this is really interesting okay. about eating it. So let, let, uh, thanks for that question because it's one of those myths that we've been trying, not, not just us here, but uh, people in the olive oil world have been trying to dispel for many, many years. And actually um, I think it was last month that the, um, USDA came out and said, it's okay to fry, it's better to fry with olive oil, something like that. Um, and, and we're doing some work with the North America Olive Oil Association uh, that, that sort of represents olive oil in, the, in, the, in North America. And, and that's sort of the, the kind of things we're trying to promote, dispel the myths, educate people. So the, the myth of frying comes from some, I, I don't know when, I cannot trace it back, but it's this um, the smoke point. Smoke point of olive oil is, is low and therefore, uh, before you know it, you're gonna get your kitchen full of smoke. And, it's, and it also becomes rancid and its chemical content yeah. changes. So um, let's break that into a couple of things. One, the, a good olive oil, the, on average, the smoke point is 415, 420 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if I ever cook at that temperature myself. I don't know how many people cook at 420, but let's say you decide you're gonna really, really fry at 420. It's not so much the smoke point. It's what, in terms of health, what's more important is the polar compounds that are produced as a result of heating oil. And there was a study, I think it was last year, a group from Australia took a bunch of oils, in anything from extra virgin all the way to you know any seed oil, and they heated the oil for six, 12, 18 hours, long, long periods of time, to see the stability, but also to see the the, the proportion of of oil that which oil produced more polar compounds. Throughout the, all their experiments, olive oil stood out as the one that gave you the least, not only right away, but prolonged period of time, the least amount of polar compounds. And that's the concern. To me, if you have a product that despite the heating does not generate polar compounds to the level that other oils do, that's the oil I'm gonna use. And, and again, there's evidence, like the example I gave, and I, I, the, me the mechanism behind it, I can only um, hypothesize, but, it, people I'm sure are looking at that, maybe the, the fact that you create the crust around a vegetable captures not only the, the, the phytonutrients in the vegetable, but also it acts synergistically to elevate the positive impact it has. Therefore, the, the, the impact on, on 
um, blood glucose compared to just using olive oil on top of it. So uh, this myth of, of the smoke point, I, you know, hopefully we'll be able to dispel it very quickly. And, and again, there's a, a North America Olive Oil Association on their website, they have a little video. If you take a pan, um, a frying pan, and you take the temperature right in the middle, like 280, 290, so it never gets to, if the olive oil is good, it will never get to a point where, unless you forget the frying pan on the stove for three hours and you get the smoke <laughs> or half an hour. But, um, but my concern is more on the polar compounds and it's been shown through experiments done in the lab, controlled experiments to show that polar compound release is the lowest in, in, in high quality olive oil. Okay, well, that is, very exciting. It means we can go home and fry eggplant and pasta to our heart's content. Yes. We have, unfortunately, so many questions that we have not had a chance to get to, but I will share them with you, Professor, after the presentation is over. And uh, anyone who wants to reach you can email us at alumniacademy at yale.edu, and we will forward the email. Uh, we're, we're just at our time, so I want to thank you, Professor Tatsos. Kiriakides for joining us today and presenting as part of our festival and give you the last word, anything you'd like to say as we close. Well, thank you for, for hosting me again and as part of this, uh, this um, uh, program that you're running this summer. And uh, hopefully um, I, I shared some information that people find useful. And don't, uh, my, my word of uh, my suggestion or recommendation, um, you know, use olive oil, um, experiment with it, with your food, um, see what you like. Um, not everybody likes the same kind of olive oil, but bottom line, try to replace your, um, your oils with olive oil. Uh, and don't expect, you know, overnight changes, but in the long run, um, the benefit that you will see, um, from the human health perspective is going to be um, noticeable. Um, so. Wonderful. Well, I hope we can have you back to continue this conversation. There's so much more that we can explore. Sure. And until then, thank you. And thank all of you for tuning in. And I hope I will see some of you on Thursday's uh, final presentation of our festival. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.